welcome everybody to this Marshall Hangout, the last one before the holidays. Um, I am very excited to have Jamie here today. Uh, Jamie is a, a Marshall alum and um, she uh, went to the Queen's University Belfast to do her first uh, degree and I'm going to get, I'm now having to remember Cambridge for the second one. Good. <laughs> um, so um, anyway, I'm very excited to have a historian today. As a historian myself, this I think I was just saying to Jamie is our first historian Marshall Hangout. Long may there be more. Um, we are recording this uh, for the website. So, um, and if you can put your cameras on, it's lovely to see everybody. I think it's helpful for Jamie to actually have an audience. But thank you very much. And Jamie, I hand it over to you. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I'm really happy to see you here and, and talk about history a bit, although I'm also going to try to relate it to some present day concerns so we can jump back and forth a little. Um, I have a few slides I'll show you, although I won't use them the whole time so that you see my face some too. Uh, but um, but uh, part of the reason that Mary asked me to do this talk is because uh, my first book has just been launched and it's actually available via Kindle tomorrow uh, or can be ordered. So no, no need to run out shout and buy it. But um, uh, my book is called The Rule of Manhood, Tyranny, Gender and Classical Republicanism in England. And um, it was it's being published with the Cambridge University Press um, early modern British history series. So I'm, I'm really excited to be alongside the other authors who have been in this uh, this great series. Um, principally, my interest is in the intersection of gender and the history of political thought. And um, I've really been keenly interested in the way that conceptions of masculinity have shaped the intellectual and political culture of England and then the kind of long term effects of this. Um, and so um, I'm going to start very quickly by just looking at the ways that we see masculine languages cropping up in um, kind of modern day republics. And I'm, I'm going to focus on America for this since Trump is, is such a good example. Um, so just to dive into some of the, the modern day, um, you know, uh, Trump has been you know, positing himself as a tough man. And there's been a lot of language of toughness, hardness, bravado, strength that have gone alongside his characterization of himself and has indeed been accepted by his base as a good um, part of his authority and legitimacy. So on the left, I have a, a meme. Actually, my, my husband's uncle posted this on Facebook a couple of days ago. I didn't have to look far to find it. Um, tough times call for tough men. Um, the other line is also really interesting. Do you have faith in Trump and Pence? Um, there's kind of a militaristic and masculine Christianity, a muscular Christianity that gets thrown forward. Um, and a lot of these languages and ideas that I see cropping up, toughness, hardness, bravado, Christian militarism, uh, just reflects for me profoundly on the same languages, the same rhetoric, the same ideas that I see in the 17th century in the context of the English kings and the English civil wars and the first English revolution. Um, on the right is an email from the Trump campaign from September 6. Um, I somehow, like others I know, got on a Trump campaign mailing list without signing up for it um, and receive about three to five emails a day from the Trump campaign. But I've stayed on the list and I actually read all of them, even as much as I'm not always real happy with what they contain, because it's just shocking to me how much I see 17th century languages repeated over and over again in the same kind of key words coming up. And so you'll notice in this email that we have words, you know, I'm tough on crime. Joe Hyden Biden is soft. So he's a soft coward. Um, he's weak. Um, so these languages, again, in masculine vigor versus weakness. Um, these uh, ideas play really well to Trump's base. Um, I don't have more recent polling, but at least in an April poll in 2016 from the Public Religion Research Institute, 68% um, of Trump supporters said they believe the U.S. had grown too soft and feminine under Barack Obama. And so, um, so you know, again, softness versus hardness, um, toughness versus weakness are, are very much a part of our political rhetoric. Um, of course, sexual bravado is too. Um, this is, you know, I could have found a million pictures for this, but, um, but the ability to attract women, to sexually please women, to have women when you want them, all of these languages, of course, are ones that um, get put to the forefront with somebody like Trump or other celebrities or other politicians. Um, simultaneously, though, I would suggest that 
even when we see, especially conservatives, but it can be others, um, pushing back at sexual bravado, they're still often using languages that describe the kind of control of women and women's sexuality in response. So I don't like sexual uh, the sexual bravado of Trump because I have wives and daughters, right, who <laughs> I try to protect. Um, and so, um, so we'll, we'll see this kind of across and in, in the gender politics all uh, very often nowadays. Um, the next slide gets into a, a bit more, uh, perhaps um, uh, politically incorrect or even um, offensive language. So of course the alt-right and white supremacist groups that have become more vocal and, and probably it seems grown in numbers over the last four years also very often pull a mantle of extreme macho masculinity and the, and um, on top of that, the kind of public shaming of others for not living into these kind of hyper-masculine ideals. So um, there was this word coined in 2015 or so calling people a cuck-servative, which is bringing together the words cuckold and conservative. And it's usually used for someone who, um, a man who's not kind of standing up for uh, white Christians or the interests of white Christians and the way they want. And so there's a lot of memes that were created calling people with immigration, conservatives are on the right. It's a satirical paper. Um, you know, making fun of someone for not for being not anti-feminist, um, et cetera. Um, I find this slur particularly interesting because the concept of cuckold was an extremely important one in the 17th century. A, a cuckold is someone whose wife has cheated on him. And um, in the 17th century, if that happened to you, very often it was the man who was publicly shamed through a ritual called the Sharavari and made to wear horns on his head and ride a horse backwards and things. And so the public shaming would be of the man for not controlling his household properly and not sexually pleasing his wife. Um, and so we see this kind of continue. Um, of course, it's not just in the era of Trump these have been. Um, there's always been a, a kind of macho militarism that people have tried to use to be electable. Um, so famously in 1988, uh, Michael Dukakis took a series of pictures of himself on a tank to try to prove um, kind of how hard, strong, masculine he was able to kind of take the military force. But um, it backfired for him um, because most people thought he didn't, he looked pretty ill placed in a tank. Um, and I have put the New York Times headline that accompanied these pictures in 1988. Forget John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, forget Rambo, meet macho Mike Dukakis. At least that's what his image makers are struggling to convey. Um, so I think this one both highlights the kind of, again, toughness and bravado towards a militaristic force, but simultaneously the ways that these can backfire. So relying upon masculinist images can be really successful in some cases, but it's also a fragile and anxious thing to use because, um, you know, heaven forbid you actually come off as not fulfilling the ideal that you put forward. Um, all of these kind of languages and ways that we see this is really not accidental. Um, I, I think it's, in fact, I'm going to argue today that it's baked into the very ways that we formed republics and the reason we formed them back in the 17th century when a lot of this political theory was written. Um, and of course, it's gone well beyond rhetoric, right? Because as we know, huge sectors of our population, in fact, were excluded and have been excluded from their voice being heard in voting and in power. So um, we've been celebrating the 100 year centennial of suffrage, women's suffrage this year, um, the 19th Amendment in the US. And, um, you know, and of course, it took 40 more years after that for um, women of color and non-whites to actually get access to the polls. And there's still a lack of representation of women in power in all sorts of ways, including um, very few governors at the state level. Of course, a woman's never reached the highest office in the U.S., even though we did have Thatcher in, par in um, parliament in Britain, et cetera. So, um, so this kind of language of exclusion has also gone alongside actual exclusion of people um, in our in our um, republics. And so um, my book is really interested in the period of time when a lot of this original political thinking gets forged. And the political thinking of the 17th century is going to go on to shape the republics that we live in um, and look to today. So um, in 1649, after almost a decade of civil wars, um, the English beheaded their anointed monarch, Charles I and they formed a, a kingless commonwealth for 11 years so until 1660. Um, famously, it was Oliver Cromwell who, who 
found himself um, in the vacuum of power, stepping up as Lord Protector um, in this period. Um, so the political languages that made this revolution possible, made it thinkable to kill an anointed king. And at the same time, the Republican thought that gets spun out um, as a result of this beheading uh, so significantly shape our American constitution that we can really still see a lot of the same fragments of these language and these ideas shaping how we view politics today. Um, a reason for this is because in the 1650s, when a lot of this Republican thought is written by people like John Milton, who you might have heard of, um, you know, a couple generations later, writers took, um, took these Republican treatises and bound them together into volumes and sold them around the world and translated them into French, for example. So the ideas of these thinkers literally sat on the bookshelf of John Adams, uh, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. They sat on the bookshelves of the Marquis de Condorcet. There's been good work that's shown how people are reading um, the 1650s writers. And so um, it, it really is in the way that we've kind of put together um, our republics. So um, my book considers then how um, this masculine thought both made this revolution possible, but also shaped the Republican thought. In, in both cases, I wanna say that um, masculine ideas drawn from it, especially the classical era are shaping the 17th century. So uh, I'm not gonna jump in and do, it's, it's, a, it's a long book, it's like 400 pages long. So I'm not gonna jump in and do all the history here because I couldn't, but I am gonna focus on this question, um, this kind of fundamental question of were republics designed only for men? I mean, is this masculinist rank language indeed a result of design? Um, and so I really think the operative words here are men. What do I mean by men? What are the conceptions of manhood at play? And then what do I mean by the design of republics? Um, and those are the kind of two ideas I'm going to sit with a little bit. And I'd love to open up to, to questions and conversations um, with you all. Um, I don't have slides for absolutely everything. I'm gonna cut out my slides now. I'll come back later when I have some quotes to show you, um, et cetera. Um, okay, so let's talk first about men, 17th century men, ideas of men. Um, and then we'll talk about republics being designed for them. Um, in the 17th century, uh, male genitalia is not sufficient for manhood. So this may be a necessary condition. You should be born with what was recognizable as the male sex, but um, you're not really considered or given the mantle of man until you're much older, until you've performed um, in the areas considered necessary for masculinity. So, um, you know, we see this even in the clothing they wear in the 17th century. Uh, children are born and put into dresses, whether you're male or female. Um, this is also helpful for changing diapers, if you think about it. But up until the age of seven, you don't even have little boys breached or put into pants. And you definitely don't have them being given the authority, power, and respect um, expected of men until much later in life. Um, in particular, it was thought that the performance of manhood needed to, be ha to happen through a few realms. And um, I would kind of distill them down to three. You needed to perform in reason, irrationality, in strength, and then in governance. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about these really quickly. Um, reason here uh, as the first one doesn't just mean being logical or well book learned, although that, that does get wrapped up in this a bit. It has more to do with the ability to um, be persuaded and to give rational argumentation and to be able to have autonomy based on rational choice. Um, so uh, Milton actually, in some of his writings, talk about, you know, what is manhood except for rational choice, right? The ability to reason and then direct one's life from it. And so there's an autonomy and rationality baked into reason as part of um, an aspect of manhood. Um, the second one, strength, is a very ableist notion. It, it's quite physical. Um, so they're not necessarily talking about strength of character. They're talking about actual physical feats on the battlefield, for example or in sporting and hunting, or in doing other kind of uh, physical activities necessary to be successful, maybe in one's trade or other aspects of life. So we see the kind of vestiges of chivalric culture hanging on <laughs> through a lot of these um, images of masculinity, um, as well as call for men to serve in arms actually overseas on the continent. And finally, um, governance uh, is a two-part category. It's both the governance of yourself and governance of others. So the idea first that I need to be in control of my passions, 
I need to be in control of my emotions and myself. Um, and simultaneously, I need to be able to exert control over others around me. And this is why um, most scholars who are social historians who look at England want to say, you're not a man in England until you're married because you have to have an independent household that you rule, your little commonwealth as it's called, to actually live fully into the expectations of being a man. And so um, governance of others could mean wife and children, it can mean apprentices, um, if you are a master, it could mean um, servants who live in your household, it could mean um, you know, having duties in the local, in the local town or in the local church, let's say, like serving as an alderman, and it could mean also running for office in parliament or being in the higher kind of councils, uh, depending on your, your status. But um, these three things, reason, strength, and governance, um, are really what men need to live into and exert, and they're the ideals, the idealistic manhood um, that, that we see people talking about in the 17th century is necessary. Um, like I pointed out before, they're also really fragile, right? There's a lot of books about anxious masculinity in the 16th and 17th century because um, all of these things are actually hard to do and perform all the time. And I, and I tell my students that as much as you might want to just hate on men historically, you also do need to be sympathetic to the fact that it would be really, really hard to live into these ideals and that a lot of these ideals are in fact good. It's, it's good to have rational choice and autonomy. It's also hard to always be in control of one's passions. And so, um, so anyway, those are some things to think about. Um, this concept of manhood is very much, it's old. It's drawn from the classical tradition, it's Greco-Roman. Um, and indeed, if you think about what are often called the four cardinal virtues um, in the Greco-Roman tradition, those are essentially what I've just outlined. So reason is like wisdom, um, strength would map on the courage, and the governance of self and others would be temperance and justice. Um, and so a lot of the thinking about ideal manhood in the 17th century is being shaped by this classical humanist tradition. It's being shaped by people reading Aristotle and Cicero in schools and universities. It's being distilled through the Book of Common Prayer. Um, and, and so it's coming from very ancient sources. But even in these very ancient sources, there still is a gender divide being expressed. The word virtue itself comes from the Latin word virtus, which means manliness. Um, and um, indeed, these, these are the qualities that Cicero is describing for the male statesman. Um, Aristotle very famously wants to talk about um, the telos of human beings, but it's really the fully male upper class man who can live into this full telos of the virtues and natural slaves and women and others um, are not living into this masculine ideal. And so even though it's very old and classical, it, re it actually retains its gendered aspects of it. Um, so the last thing I want to say about man here is I think quite hopefully it's obvious that already in the ideas of manhood, you have built in ideas of power, right? Men in their proper position, properly living into their virtues should be in charge. And, um, you know, men need to be given authority, in fact, to live fully and participate fully in what it means to be a man. And so, um, so there's a lot of conversations in the 17th century is often called the age of absolutism, the moment when kings are getting significant power, Louis XIV in France, King James in England is expressing these things. Um, and kings are often taking on the mantle of being, you know, the most manly, right? The fathers of the kingdom. And so a lot of this rhetoric about masculinity isn't just happening in an ideal space, but is actually happening in the halls of power. And kings are boasting of themselves as living into the full ideal of masculinity. Um, they're in charge of the large commonwealth and the men within it are in charge of the small commonwealths, right, of power. Um, and so that's why in the first half of my book, I'm really thinking about the ways that thinking with gender and thinking with masculinity could lead kings to be um, charged with tyranny because when kings failed to live up to these masculine standards, it actually opened them up to um, classical discourses about failed men and tyrants. And so um, in the 17th century, they, they're bringing in stories of Nero and other failed tyrants to reflect upon the failures of masculinity they think they see in their kings. Um, what I'm gonna focus on today though, um, is thinking about why this matters for republicanism. So a little bit less about the story of tyranny and a little more about what they built in its wake. Um, in 1649, those who behead the king and establish a republic 
are going to start arguing that not only did their particular kings, like King Charles, fail in masculinity, but they're going to take the much more radical step to argue that the institution of monarchy um, is already a failure for masculine standards. And so that's, I'm going to jump back to a slide to talk about this, but the ways that these kind of languages about masculine success and failure can lead to republicanism is already baked into these kind of initial questions about monarchy. Um, so we'll go back to my slide then. Um, so, um, so these are just some of the questions that I see thinkers asking by the time we get to 1649 and through the civil wars. Um, some of them are earlier as well. But um, the kind of more moderate question that gets asked is, you know, if we look at the monarchs who are ruling Europe in the 17th century, are they generally living up to these standards of masculinity? Do we see reason and strength and good governance happening at the halls of monarchs? And, you know, a lot of people will say no. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of not great monarchs um, or a lot of cracks in the system. And so kind of more moderate views in the period would be, well, how do we make it so that our monarchs are the most virtuous men ruling? And um, there's some early arguments in the 1620s and, and earlier where people say, well, let's hold on to kingship, but elect them. Let's find the most virtuous guys around and elect them to be our kings. And then our monarchs will live into these ideals. But as we get to the more radical points, and especially in the English Revolution, um, people just start asking if the institution of monarchy itself sets up masculine failure in a society. And so um, they start asking, you know, does living under a monarch impede our manliness? We, men, writing about these things, are we, in fact, impeded from living into our full standards of manhood because of our monarch? And in the first instance, they'll say, well, if you live under a tyrant, absolutely. And I can give you some quick examples of this. Um, if my king is too much of a coward to enter England into war, then I don't have the opportunity to go prove my, my courage on the battlefield, right? I'm kept from the battle. Or if my monarch is um, not in control of his passions and not in control of the women in his household, if they're all committing adultery, then it's going to be really hard for me to model control, for me to keep my wife in line, for me to keep my sons from becoming corrupted. Um, there's also um, ideas, you know, if my monarch is irrational, my monarch always acts on an, a whim and doesn't listen to reason debate, then I am not going to be given opportunities to give reason debate. My thoughts are going to be censored. I'm not going to get to be in parliament. I'm not going to get to counsel the king. And this is indeed what happens when Charles dissolves parliament for 11 years and refuses to listen to the council of parliament. They say, look, this tyrant is keeping us from fully living into our manhood. Um, but we see an even further more radical thought arise in 1649 and beyond, um, which argues that even if my monarch is not a tyrant, even if I get blessed with a really virtuous king in charge, it will still stop me from being manly. It will still impede me from fully living into my masculinity. And I'm going to give you a quote here from John Milton that illustrates this thought. And forgive me, it's long. I have modernized the language a little bit, um, but I'm going to read it because I think it, it really gets at this point. So Milton, uh, most famously the poet for Paradise Lost, but he writes a series of um, Republican prose tracts between the 40s and 50s in, in England. Um, he says, the happiness of a nation must needs be firmest and most certain in a full and free council of their own electing. So in other words, in a republic with a government by and for the people where no single person but reason only sways. And what madness is it for them who might manage nobly their own affairs themselves? So what madness is it for male citizens, sluggishly and weakly to devolve all on a single person, and more like boys under age than men, to commit all to his patronage and disposal, who neither can perform what he undertakes, and yet for undertaking it, though royally paid, will not be their servant but their lord. How men unmanly must it needs be to count such a one the breath of our nostrils, to hang all our felicity on him, all our safety, our well-being, for which if we were anything else but sluggards or babies, we need depend on none but God and our own counsels and our own active and virtue and in industry. So, I mean, I think right here, Milton gets at the heart at just even living under a king in an unfree society um, undermines my masculine, rational autonomy and choice, uh, my independence. 
So um, the the other thing I want to speak about briefly, and then and then open up the conversation is um, the ways then that our very republics are kind of foundational thought that have um, uh, been built in this um, from the 17th century and then lived into over these couple of centuries were really built then to accommodate male citizens so that they could fully realize their manhood, so that they had opportunity to live into reason, strength, and governance. And so um, on the right here then, I just provide some, some quick examples of this. Um, we see Milton and others theorizing that they want a free state, a republic that would make it possible for, you know, first men to perform rational autonomy through their choice of government, right? So it's arguments for the consent of the governed and voting. Um, they want to create a system where men can persuade others through rational debate, so it's reason. Um, so there's, there's lots more I could list here, but freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, um, freedom of assembly and protest, um, freedom of religion, um, you know, no press censorship. That these kinds of ideas are coming from the idea that we men need to be ruled by reason, so we need to hear arguments, right, and be allowed to follow um, uh, the liberty of conscience. Um, republics need to provide systems where men can participate. And this means not only the ability to run for office, but also we see in a lot of republics moral laws that get passed that try to help you have better control over your household. So there's a lot of anti-adultery laws that are pushed through um, in the 1650s um, that try to make it easier for men to control their wives um, and, and a support of the kind of little commonwealth alongside the moral ideas of the big commonwealth. Um, and finally, we need a republic where men can exert physical courage on the field of battle. And this kind of language is we're going to lead to not only calls for war, men to be able to go fight, but even calls for empire. Um, and actually, my second book I'm, I'm getting ready to write, write is going to think more about the colonial imperial um, span of this thought. Um, so really quickly, I won't read these quotes to you, but um, we again see this in all kinds of ways. So again, Milton in a different work, he's looking back at Rome and he's talking about how Romans and others have shown that the only people who really can exercise these liberties they're trying to put into their society, um, the only people who can do this are really just and virtuous men. And if other people try to live into the freedom and liberty of the Republic, it's not gonna be unwieldy in their hands. And so Milton goes on to talk about how we wanna build a Republic for the most just men um, to create good laws so that good men can enjoy these laws and everyone else can receive the curb they need to keep them in line, right? Um, Marchmont Needham, uh, who's, who my second book's going to be on, um, in The Excellency of a Free State, he's laying out lots and lots of arguments for why we should have the freedoms we enjoy. But it's a lot of it is couched then, um, such as in this passage, in an idea that if we can be a really true, free, liberty-loving people, then like Rome, we will also become an empire where we can share our ideas of liberty abroad and liberate, quote-unquote, everybody else, propagate our liberty um, in other places. And so Needham, for example, talks about after Cromwell defeated the Scottish, they made it possible then for Scotsmen themselves to become actualized as men. Right, they can begin now to know themselves men and to breathe after liberty. So there's a lot of um, kind of dangerous ideas about colonialism that can get um, mixed in with these kind of Republican ideas. Um, so these are my concluding thoughts. And then I, I'd love to chat, um, you know, why does this matter? Uh, what's the kind of takeaway? Um, the Republican tradition, uh, the, the tradition of having a Republic governed by and for the people um, where citizens, um, are running the society, um, on the one hand, introduce these fundamental ideas and freedoms that we continue to hold on to and cherish and that are highly important. The consent of the governed, the liberty of thought and expression, voting, access to political office, et cetera. Um, but a lot of these then were also um, defined, brought about, intertwined with um, strict gender divides and moral control, exclusivity and a kind of masculinist rhetoric right, that has limited people from power and voting access, um, support of a kind of militaristic colonialism, um, and a lot of wielding of gender language and praise and rebuke, such as what I was um, showing in the beginning. Um, solutions, if you think we need them, um, I, I, I personally do. Um, you know, there, there have been thinkers who've looked at the Republican tradition, of course, noticed 
how exclusionary it can be with voting access and other things, who have said, well, if we just redefine citizen as human or a manliness as humanness, it will solve the problem. If we just get, make it so everybody votes and everybody can run for office, a lot of this will be solved. Um, I'm, I'm maybe less optimistic about that. Uh, women have been voting for 100 years and we still haven't had a female president. It hasn't seemed to really um, magically solved some of that. I don't wanna say magic, but it hasn't worked itself out easily. Um, there's also ideas about, should we instead have conversations about what an excellent citizen would be and try to think about those qualities in a more kind of broad humanistic way rather than through such a gendered conception. But of course, then you get into problems of, well, whose idea of human excellence do we do we decide upon, right? And, and how do we have public discourse about that? So um, so with that, I'll, um, I'll end my talk for now and, and, and wait for your thoughts or questions. I'm also happy to talk more about the 17th century history if anyone wants to talk about that a bit more. If you'd like to put your name in the chat, if you want to ask a question and then we'll just invite you to bring your camera up. It's a small enough group that we can do that. Jamie, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, sort of on the examples of what you might see in the US Constitution, I was just interested, what, what are the sort of obvious things that you would point to from the kind of <laughs> Commonwealth of the UK to to the Constitution. You mean the the general Republican principles, or do you mean like some of the masculinist? Well, the masculinist. I think the masculinist stuff is kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, so we often read. Now, let me just back up and say, there's also you know this liberal tradition influencing things too, right? And and um, is it John Locke or is it John Milton more influencing us? It's both, and they're mixed in together, and it's complicated and and intellectual historians debate endlessly about it. But, um, but you know, I think if you just look even at the Declaration of Independence, which of course is also being fed from John Locke, um, this kind of idea of holding truth to be self-evident of men being created equal, endowed by their creator with the rights of life, liberty, property, right? And um, a lot of these ideas of the ability to um, kind of live fully into one's rational autonomy, own property. I mean, a lot of these rights, people have already pointed out, like, well, this was clearly excluding or most likely excluding African-Americans, right? But I think it's also excluding those who really don't fit the bill of being able to live into liberty. Um, and if you look at the US Constitution, um, there are these fundamental freedoms, of course, uh, freedom of expression and freedom of thought and religion, et cetera. But the actual practice of these in these institutions um, have often been governed by and were, were created on systems where um, they really were thinking about the male citizen as being the ones to live into those rights, right? And so there's been, it's not always from the government top down, but there's been a, a, a political culture that has tended to silence um the other sorts of voices by calling them dangers to the citizenry right or as um, not really representing what it means to be a patriotic american right um so i don't know i i could think of more specific examples but those are those are the ones that come to my mind kind of at, at the top brilliant um alan bookbinder has a question he's a commissioner okay, yeah. um, hello uh, jamie thank you very much um for that talk that was fascinating and um uh, as you were talking, you made me think about Ma uh, Margaret Thatcher uh. as uh, as an example of what was always seen as very macho leadership. Yeah, you know, someone who won a war, who took on the unions, um, who was a uh, you know, determined, stubborn, um, uh, dogmatic mm -hmm. preacher. Um, uh, and I just wondered how that example fit into into your sort of model of manliness. Absolutely, I, I think this is a really, I think this is a really good point, and it, it gets at what I'm, I'm maybe struggling to kind of um, describe to you as it, it's not enough to just open the gate to let some women through, right? There's still um, a way of being and acting that's rewarded. Um, that um, that women will be judged by, and so I think Thatcher is this is this wonderful case of this. Um, 
you know, she's um, the self-determined, rational, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, um, Protestant minister's daughter who, who worked hard. Well, he's not the minister, I guess, entirely, but um, who worked hard with the grocery store, right? And so you have this sense of her as this kind of self-made woman. And then in her policies as, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on the 1980s, but in her, uh, from what I know of her policies, I mean, her entering the Falklands War, which was not necessary, absolutely. I mean, there, there could have been diplomatic and other channels explored, right, in the Falklands War. And, um, but instead, um, there's a show of British strength, right? Um, and the celebration through military and other shows afterwards. Um, Margaret Thatcher is also, um, you know, She's the PM, but she's picking an entirely male cabinet, right? And we see it in the 17th century in England and also after that, that even when we have women who rise up to kind of spectacular areas of power for their moment, that they don't tend to bring other women with them and they don't tend to try to rescue a notion of femininity as acceptable for power. Um, before the period I study, Queen Elizabeth's a great example of this. You know, Queen Elizabeth actually does nothing for women <laughs> as a group um, in 16th century England. She um, she's really good at taking on the mantle of manliness. She says, you know, I have famously, I might have the weak and feeble body of a woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. Right? There's always this patriotism thrown into these statements, and so um, so. By claiming the mantle of, usually these women claim the mantle of exceptional. I'm an exceptional woman. I'm not like the rest of my sex. I have these strong characteristics. Um, I've overcome the weakness of women to get to my place. And usually when they take that tact of exceptionalism, they do a really good job then keeping every other type of woman or anyone who has these weak, feminine, soft qualities at bay. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think Thatcher's a really great example of this. Um, and I even think, gosh, I don't want to be on the record too much about about Hillary Clinton, because I think she's very complicated. But I even think about how the kind of line Hillary Clinton had to take where she had to, you know, be strong woman who stands on her own feet, even though she was married to Bill Clinton, right, as secretary of state, et cetera. But simultaneously, you know, she gets criticized as not motherly enough, right? And so she, some some current women have this weird problem of, of being too masculine, but you can't be too feminine, right? So I, I think we still haven't quite cracked it. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. Um, Francis, did you want to ask something? You had your, your mic undone, but I don't have to put you on the spot. If I May I, Mary? Can I just speak uh -huh. in? Um, that was a very interesting exchange with Alan because, in in a way, the um, I think of Margaret Thatcher, um, whose yeah. reign I lived under, as you can imagine. I think of Margaret Thatcher um, and her characteristics as a very crude form of the manliness that you're talking about in classical republicanism of the early 17th century. Um, so, I mean, to take the argument to extremes, I mean, forgive me, Trump is anything but manly in that sense. Uh -huh. Because I, I mean, I loved your talk, Jamie. Thank you so much. It's, you know, yeah, yeah. It's really terrific. Um, I mean, the, the, the characteristics of manhood, which you brought out, the reason, the strength and, and the governance are actually quite sophisticated and subtle and the reverse of the um, macho type of male, as it were, which is not what you're talking about. Yeah. So th those subtleties, I think, which are mm -hmm. the question very helpfully brought out, um, throw a whole new light uh, on how we judge certain women um, leaders yeah. and rulers today. But they also sh um, shed light on the sorts of arguments that were put forward, let's say, in the late 19th, early 20th century for excluding women from power. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, women were not fit to have power, I paraphrase, because they didn't have reason. They didn't have experience of governance, not even ultimately in their own household. It's not a question of biology they don't have the right genitalia you see what I mean so all mm -hmm. these things I think come out wonderfully from your talk thank you but I'm um, I'll leave it to somebody else to come in now but thank you so much no I I think you're absolutely right Francis and I I bring up Trump not because he's 
particularly good at it, but because he, his, his, um, his base want it. Right. And, and that's what yes. I think is very, very, that's another oh. reason I read the campaign mail. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's this longing that's expressed. Um, and I have to say, I have significant numbers of my family who are in the Trump base. So I, you know, this is my own household. I, I, I grew up with these ideas. Um, you know, there's this kind of longing for like a hard, tough guy in charge and, and Trump tries to live into that. But, um, but the first, you know, couple hundred pages of my book looks at why, how they say men fail in this. And I actually see Trump's activities much more um, mapping on to those discussions than to the actual successful discussions. So um, I spend a lot of time, yes, I, I see from Jacob, Trump is more Neronian and all sorts more like Nero in all sorts of ways than people would, would want to admit. But um, uh, I have two chapters in my book on stories about Nero that they tell over and over again in the 17th century to criticize James and Charles. And um, Nero is a really problematic tyrant because he wants to look masculine and important as an emperor, but um, but he's too interested in, um, in music and um, in dilly dallying and pleasures, right? He um, he his sexual charades are a problem for Nero. I'm um, just like you know, for someone like Trump, um, you can try to do the sexual bravado all you want, but the, the sexual charades at the end of the day might make you look actually very uncontrolled right out of line with your passions um trump has also criticized um for not having good control of his family i mean on and on and on and so um just like nero so um so i agree someone like thatcher has actually did a much better job um <laughs> living into these ideals and i also want to see that i find it very challenging because there are parts of these um ideals that are great i mean i want my I want my person in charge to have good governance over their passions. I want them to be reasonable and persuaded by, um, by rational debate, right? There's, there's all sorts of, I want them to be courageous in the right way, right? To have the right view of fear and not be rash, right? I mean, so I think part of my, my trouble as I think about what to do with this heritage is, is there's parts of this ethic that um, that I want to affirm is true human excellence, and there's all other there's all kinds of other ways that it's come out, and as you said so well, Francis, the subtlety of it, right? There's all kind of other ways that it's been lived out that have been, um, in fact, led to vice and exclusion, and are been problematic. And so I um, I don't think it's enough to just kind of throw it all out. <laughs> Let's say I right, Jamie. I think yeah. Jacob's got a question for you. Yes, yes. Um, Go ahead. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. And my, my fingers were tapping over to the email address of our acquisitions librarian at Dickinson. So hopefully my students- Oh, thank you. Online as soon as this spring. Um, I, I, I wanna ask a question that's kind of following on from Alan's and maybe a little unfair. So I, I wanna say that <laughs> I did the talk, but I was a little disappointed because I was hoping sometimes sort of gender studies historiography or historiography that uses the lens of gender discovers and excavates lost voices that in which we, that resonate with our own time. And I was hoping I was going to learn yeah, about yeah. the Republican tradition in 17th century England. That was not what I got. There, uh -huh. was, there, there was no such tradition, or at least it, it's it's not the argument here. And I was struck, I, I taught both of these texts last semester. Here's the blazing world. Here's Paradise Lost. I was hoping uh -huh. that there was a Republican Cavendish. She was, of course, a total Stuart. Uh, yeah, no, bones, she's a royalist, but, no. but anyway. <laughs> All the way down. After that, here's what was, I taught this semester throat clearing. Here's my real question, which is a <laughs> hundred years later or a hundred odd years later with the French Revolution and with say Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women, mm -hmm. there is an idea of Republicanism that still draws on some classical concepts but has liberated itself from, I agree, just the unrelievedly masculinist framework of, of classical <laughs> Republicanism. Going back to the rape of Lucrece, come to think of it, you know, as a yes. sort of founding yes. myth. Of, of, you know, ending sexual license and, and asserting control over women's chastity as the founding act of the Roman Republic. How did we get from uh, basically Milton to Wollstonecraft? What changes in, and I know this yeah. is unfair because I know this is the uh, after 1660, which is when your book ends, Well, I teach Wollstonecraft, so I know her. Political tradition that has, you know, that, that, that has an alternative to what you've, the, the in some ways more discouraging 
picture of the you know genealogy of republicanism <laughs> that you've presented yeah, um, uh, that's such a good question, uh, and, I, and I'll forgive it for being unfair. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I don't think it's unfair at all. I think it's an important part of the tradition. Um, I also want to say, too, that if you want to look for female voices of republicanism in the 17th century, Lucy Hutchinson, right, is going to be your woman rather than a Margaret Cavendish, um, and David Norbrook's uh, coming out with a volume of Lucy Hutchinson's thought um, as we speak. I don't know if it's out yet, so that, that's a resource I'd throw to you, but um, Wilson Craft is so interesting, and I I teach her actually every year uh, to my students in my um, general liberal arts course. Um, and I, you know, I understand Wollstonecraft as, uh, you know, she, she has these moments where she says, am I trying to make a bunch of masculine women? And she says, yes and no, right? Like I'm not trying to make a bunch of women who run around and hunt and do sports, but I'm making women who live into the virtues. Right? Don't we want our women to be courageous? Don't we want our women to be able to run shops and be independent and autonomous? Don't we want our women educated? And um, don't we want our women to have um, good marriages? Right? Don't we want our women to not just be these sexual objects? And I, it's funny because Wollstonecraft um, is sometimes, uh, as far as I know, derided by certain contemporary feminists as being too conservative and um, kind of buying into these systems too much. But um, I read her as um, extremely Aristotelian. I read her view of marriage, for example, as trying to make possible virtue friendship between men and women, right? So the idea of the highest form of friendship was thought to only be between men who can have these virtues, right? Um, but Wollstonecraft's trying to make it possible for women to be educated in the virtues and then form real friendships with men and that be the basis of marriage. And I actually find that to be a beautiful thing um, to advocate for. And I always teach this in a very, um, I don't know, in a, in a very positive light when I teach it. And you will come and jump in, Jacob, and, and you're welcome to if you want. But this is where I, I mean quite seriously. Um, well, let me first say that I don't wish to only paint a negative picture because my my book, my book has actually been charged by reviewers as being too anti-monarchical and too much on the side of Republicans at moments. And so I, I, as much as my talk here is quite negative, the first 200 pages where I'm showing how they're like chipping away at monarchy is, is maybe too celebratory at moments. And so, um, you know, but simultaneously, um, and simultaneously, let me also say that, you know, it's a really big thing to push for the consent of the governed. And you're right, it comes with lots of baggage because the original consent language is a reflection of um, the rape of Lucretia and these kind of Roman stories, the Roman Republic and the problems of, I mean, there's all kinds of ideas of tyranny being likened to sexual assault. And so a lot of the responses to this about consent um, have sexual tones in them. And so it's a really mixed bag for me because I, I read Milton and I read Needham and I get really, really excited by people making arguments that citizens through rational debate should come to ideas for good governance and they should vote, right? And I feel very moved by this and I, and I want a republic to succeed. But then simultaneously, the question for me is really how do we how do we move like a Wollstonecraft and make it possible for us to conceptualize um, things that have been traditionally feminine as also parts of virtue, for example, right? So I want to talk about a, a ruler that not only has courage, but also has empathy, right? A ruler that is tough, but also soft at moments he or she needs to be soft, right? And so my question I'm, I'm probably a little C conservative in a way because I want to hold on to some kind of conception of human excellence here that's tied to this tradition. But simultaneously, I want to somehow have real conversations about um, what should be the contemporary virtues and how are they accessible um, as an ideal for, um, for citizens in a society, right? And so um, that's not... That's not something everyone's going to like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, but that's something I, I continue to draw from this tradition. So I don't know if that's if that's um, you and I can chat much more about this, Jacob. But um, yeah, that's um, those are some of my thoughts. Um, I see Peter. No, actually, there were people before that. Um, hi, Dan. Hi, Dan Weeks. He's two thousand six Marshall Scholar with me. Um, Dan Weeks wants to know, did Nero spend too much time on Twitter? And he absolutely would have if Twitter existed. Um, it's such a great question. And in fact, um, something I see in a lot of the tyrant stories are tyrants wanting to be popular. 
Um, there's this real disdain for popularism in classical stories about tyrants, and they're always just wooing to the lower passions of the masses. And this is always thought to be a problem. Um, a, a, an accessible example, I think, is if you've read um, or seen um, uh, Shakespeare's um, Julius Caesar. And of course, Julius Caesar by the Roman senators was frequently cited as being too much into popularism. But in that play, there's all these you know, lines where they're like, he plays too much to the people and um, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, kind of more recent, uh, versions of Julius Caesar, they actually will have people on phones and, and like Twitter's a part of it. So I, I think that that absolutely um, is involved. And the question is, does your ruler play on which passions do pe the ruler play on? Does the ruler woo, woo people through fear and through other anger, through other sorts of passions? Or does the ruler try to um, engage citizens or subjects through um, rational discourse and through our kind of higher, better virtues? Right, that's a lot of the questions that are getting asked about popularity and tyranny in these. Um, I don't know if Dan wants to say anything else, but I, I can move on to, okay, I got the thumbs up. Um, uh, uh, Gabriella, Gabriella, sorry, I'm trying to see the chat here. Um, do you think that forms of toxic masculinity in men and women are more likely to arrive in times of economic and social crisis or are constant throughout historic periods? Um, I really think this is interesting. Um, I mean, I guess the operative word here is toxic, right? Um, I definitely see a sort of um, uh, gendering of discourse as a fairly constant. And there's been some, some really good thinkers in the field who've come well before me who have talked about um, associations of power as, as pretty much always being shored up through different kinds of gendered rhetoric. So I think the gendered rhetoric is a constant, but I do think it becomes most toxic when people feel in crisis um, or feel they have something to prove, right? So um, Elizabeth gives her heart and stomach of a king speech and, and presents herself in that way, um, you know, in the wake of the Spanish Armada, right? Um, and, um, you know, a lot of, I, I've, I, I can't point to exact people who've written on this, but I've been reading a lot of articles in the Atlantic and other places where people talk about how um, strong men come up into times of crisis, usually, and whip people up into fear, and then step into that void through a kind of macho bravado, right, um, for, to solve the crisis. And so I do think that you're right, that um, it's usually when people feel most vulnerable that they want a quote-unquote strong ruler to step in and take charge. And so I, I think that can plant the seeds then um, for more toxic masculinist forms to thrive. Um, uh, if that, if that's all right, I'll move on to, to Peter. Why do you think 1649 to 1660 Commonwealth wealth experiment in England failed? Well, if I had like the best argument for that, I'd be a little bit richer because everyone wants to know. Um, but, um, my, my sense is that, um, well, the, my sense is that there's a few reasons. Um, I don't think they set up the institutional structures that would have been needed um, for a successful commonwealth. Um, the instrument of government that um, governed Lord Protector Cromwell um, was not all bad. It still had a place for parliament, but um, there was a lack of free and fair elections through much of the 1650s that causes people to to fail in having real representation and to lose confidence in government. And there's also the setting up of a system of um, of colonels uh, running the regions and um, kind of stamping down martial law in a lot of the regions. And then there's just unbelievable destitution and loss. I mean, so many people die through the English civil wars. And so um, I just think that, um, you know, doesn't matter Cromwell's success um, in all sorts of other realms. I just think there were too many economic and political crises that, and they didn't create the structure needed to address those in a real way. Um, and most importantly, they don't have a real system of deciding who's going to rule after Cromwell. So, you know, obviously, I mean, I'm not new in saying this, but Oliver Cromwell's death and the rise of Richard Cromwell is just the death nail, right? Um, the death, death nail in that system. So if they had gotten better constitutional structures in place, I think to handle things like the succession of power, the economic crises, 
um, and the kind of free and fair elections, I think it might have survived. A lot of the writings I read in the Republicans are coming in the late 1650s by people who are criticizing what has happened to the Republican project. And one of the main things they talk about over and over again is the lack of free and fair elections, 1650s. So that's my, that's my, my very short TED talk on that, but um, relying a lot on other scholars for that answer. Um, I think, Jamie, I think that's probably it. Yeah. I think that the rest are just comments. Um, Great. You've done an hour and you've done wonderfully. Thank you well, so thank you. much. That was really, really interesting. And thank you. I think those questions are quite challenging. So well done for answering <laughs> yeah. those questions. It's challenged thank the historian. <laughs> but, thank um, you all so much. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you everybody for coming today and spending an hour with us. Uh, um, uh, this is the last of the Hangouts for this half of the um, year. Uh, we, I am beginning to plan for next year, so if anybody has suggestions of people they'd like to hear, alumni that we have, or commissioners, ex-commissioners, anybody that you think would be interesting that's in the Marshall community, let me know. And um, I just this left to me to wish you all very happy holidays, and um, I look forward to seeing you all in the new year for the next set of Hangouts. So thank you very much, and thank you, Jamie, for that. That's fantastic. Thank you all so much. It was really fun. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.